Misereor superturbam. I have compassion on the crowd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, just a warning for our guests. Uh, this sermon is going to be about the fires of hell. So if you have any young children uh, who are sensitive or scrupulous, it might be good to uh, have them play in a yard or, or whatever. Uh, just to give you a warning. I've been with the sisters now for two and a half years, and as you've experienced, very rarely, if at all, I've ever spoke about the fires of hell. And the reason why I preach today on this theme is not that I think that your souls, my dear sisters, are in danger, for I don't think that at all, but it's part of religious life. That's the reason why God called you is not just to be behind mon monastic walls and just to experience consolations throughout life. It is a tremendous mission. Christ set you apart so you can console his heart and that you can exercise in a very specific way the dogma of the Catholic faith, the communion of saints which means that you can win so many graces for souls that are in tremendous danger within the members of Christ's body. And we adore Christ, we love Christ, and we know it hurts him whenever he has to amputate a member of his own body, never more to be vivified by his grace and love. And so, the anniversary next week will be the 104th anniversary of the vision of hell that Our Lady of Fatima showed the, the little tiny children in Portugal. So I thought this would be a good moment. And plus, as our Lord expressed, I have compassion on the crowd. In other words, our Lord is pitying the crowd and wishing to do something for these souls and wishing that we join in with Him so as to fight tooth and nail for the salvation of a single soul. So we ask ourselves, why do we have to reflect from time and again on the four last things, the eternal truths? Well, my dear sisters and dear guests of the sisters, a saint once said, remember thy last end and thou shalt never sin. If we had an understanding, all Christians should from time to time meditate on the eternal truths so as to avoid evil and to do good in Christ. And even within the monastic walls, sometimes a mandate from a superior can aggravate us and sometimes we don't deal with it as virtuously as we should. But if we had before our eyes the flames of hell, not just not for ourselves, but for souls, then it's almost like we would welcome a lot more aggravations from the superiors or from the nuisances that surround me, even within monastic life. We would seem to be more patient all of a sudden, knowing that this effort is going toward a good end, to save souls from hell, to glorify God. So as consecrated souls, my dear nuns, you are brides of the divine Savior who has compassion on the Christian multitudes and even the heathens. And you therefore have access, a very special access to his compassionate heart. Perhaps, sisters, you don't see this often, but many people come and tell me 
the prayers I asked the good sisters to pray for, it was answered, or this or that aspect. And they're so grateful for the influence you exercise upon the sacred heart of Jesus. So that by all of this, this religious life that you live, nothing goes to waste, but rather you become an efficient secondary cause for the sparing of many hardened sinners and your prayers for priests. I think priests are much more in danger of going to hell than any other Christian. Our Lord said those who receive more, more will be demanded. So say a little prayer for me, for me. <laughs> <When he, laughs> say some prayers, please. You may circulate Christ's precious blood. This month dedicated to the precious blood of Christ. You may circulate that blood and grace of Christ into the some putrid members of his mystical body that otherwise would die forever and ever in the eternal flames of hell. The teaching of the church has always been the same. Up until 1960, the Catholic Church, the Fathers of the Church, the Apostles themselves, all the way up until 1960, had believed in the real, real flames of hell, fires of hell. After 1960, introducing the church are many ideas of symbolism and this, that, and a state of mind and all kinds of stuff. And they forget about the real flames that St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas and the very apostles themselves believe and preach. We have to be aware of this great uh, removal from our true faith, the deposit of faith regarding these matters. And they will be plunged, if anyone goes to hell, they'll be plunged into the eternal flames forever and ever without being able to escape. No such thing as the Je Jesuitical idea of total annihilation after, you know, from since 1970 onwards, the annihilation of bad souls, wicked souls. They just become annihilated somehow. Uh, none of that is true. They will experience true consciousness and they will receive their bodies back on the last day and there will be uh, eternal tortures for all eternity. Now we must believe that hellfire is worth, worse than that of earthly fire. St. Saint, Saint Augustine says the hellfire compared to earthly fire, earthly fire is like an image within a frame on the wall of a fire compared to hellfire. In other words, it says absolutely nothing in comparison to the heat and the ardor of hellfire. And why is hellfire hotter than earthly fire? Because hellfire is created solely to punish, whereas earthly fire is created to serve the needs of man, like cooking, heating a cold house, purifying metals, etc. And sometimes the good fire could be used for bad ends according to wicked men's hearts, like burning each other or torturing someone. Another reason why hell fire is hotter than earthly fire is because it's a larger fire. The book of Apocalypse says the lake of fire. So something that's bigger is always hotter when it comes to fire. The greater the fire, the more heat does it put out. For example, if one house is on fire, the whole neighborhood is warm. But if all the houses of a neighborhood is on fire, then the whole city is warm. And so goes it. 
On and on it goes. Another reason why hellfire is hotter is because it's enclosed. Here in this earth we have the gift of oxygen, so therefore the, the fire kind of diffuses as it goes around. But there in hell it'll be enclosed. If you look during the Mass, we have problems with our thurible. So if you keep the thurible closed in between usage, uh, the priest's fingers will be burnt as he <laughs> grabs onto the chains the next time around. Whereas if you open up the lid and keep it, keep it open, then he can touch all parts of the chains later on with no problems. And that's why it is hotter in trapped heat would be unbearable to endure. And also the last reason is because hellfire is kindled by the breath of God. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 27 and 33. I quote, Topeth, meaning hell, is prepared from yesterday, deep and wide. The nourishment thereof is fire and much wood. And get this, the breath of the Lord as a torrent of brimstone kindling it. And when God's breath comes upon something, can you imagine a, a little toddler trying to blow, you know, a little coal into heat? But imagine a big, strong, uh, weightlifting man takes that same, those lungs of iron and just blows in a coal and then the whole coal can be completely consumed within seconds. How about the lungs of God when he blows upon those unending coals of hell? Hot and hotter and hotter they get. St. Rob Robert uh, Bellarmine also talks about the extreme colds spells in hell too as it goes from extreme heat to extreme colds uh, fluctuating back and forth also quoting scriptures about the, the eternal place of doom. So imagine my dear sisters and dear guests of the sisters were you to put your hand on a red hot iron for eight seconds flesh before your very eyes will wither away upon your hand. Pus will soon come raw in a pain that pulsates and a pain that reaches to the very marrow of your bones for just eight seconds. Imagine if we take your same body and throw your whole body upon that same red hot iron for 24 hours and you will not be able to be dead. You will not die. The agony and the cries of agony in those 24 hours will even make a very hardened sinner to shudder with fear and compassion upon you. And so therefore imagine infinitely hotter fire and it never ends, burning not only the surface of one's body, but all the organs within one's body. And don't just think, oh, well, they have a chance because they have a few, several hundred years before they've experienced physical pain in hell. No, because the fathers of the church talk about um, just like the soul is apprehensive when you put it close to the fires, so too, even though the body is not there for some soul, he's still apprehensive and could feel in certain ways the physical pains of that hellfire, even though he's waiting for his body on the resurrection of the last day. So anyway, you, anyway you slice it, there's already pains already. Imagine all those organs that are heated. Could you imagine when you put a thermometer 
in your mouth and you pull it out and it's um, 102 degrees and you feel kind of dizzy just because of a three degrees more in your interior heat of your body. Well, imagine thousands of degree, degrees more where your kidneys are boiling, your pancreas is fried and sizzling continuously. And all this causes such, such dizziness and tremendous sickness of body, of being, you put yourself in a bathtub and the water will disappear in three seconds because of just, it evaporates in thin air. All of that could be possible just because of one mortal sin non-confessed and non-repentant, persevering unto death, committing this sin against the Holy Ghost until death. For one soul, and we live in a time and an age where God has been thoroughly publicly rejected, where there are so many souls on their way to eternal damnation. So many souls are going down to the path of perdition. As our Lord Jesus himself tells us in Matthew chapter 7, that the path that leads to the narrow gate, few choose it, and few walk it, but the path that leads to perdition is wide and spacious and populated beyond imagination. Someone would say, well, our Lord doesn't have the sensitivities of our modern age. He doesn't have to. He just has to be Christ. He doesn't need to share our modern sensitivities. He pronounces it for all ages. So people are going down to hell because they consciously and definitively reject grace and irrevocably disobey God. And they taught us in the Vishit as religious, and this should be one of the greatest passions we have as we live religious life, is to pray for the consolation of the heart of Christ, the glorification of the Heavenly Father, and the eternal salvation of souls. At least it's that way in the Vishits and religious life of those who are aspiring toward the priesthood, because that's what the priesthood is all about, is saving souls from hell with Christ. And he also incorporates those consecrated women into the same line of thought. Praying for souls. How many in the hospitals gasping for breath and no one's calling the priest and all they think about is, to, is how they're gonna throw the ashes on Lambert Field in Green Bay Packers Stadium. How flattered and puffed up in pride could you be in the hour of your death like that? That's a sign the devils have attacked and won that heart and unable to turn loose back to the angels and the saints. And yet, the great saints of old, flogging themselves with permission of their superiors, don't do this alone, flogging themselves to the point of blood so that one single soul could be pardoned and receive the enlightenment. Don't forget what St. Jerome says. I forgot the exact number, but he says out of like, I think it was like 60,000 heathens and hardened sinners on a deathbed, only one would possibly convert. Only one. And so therefore, the religious of all ages, even if we have just have that one soul that would be a tremendous victory for a lifetime. Sacrificing, praying, being holy, virtuous for souls. Now, I don't know about you, but this kind of scared me when I read this from St. Ignatius Loyola in his great work, The Spiritual Exercises. Gives food for thought. He says this about himself. Could you imagine a, a canonized saint, pre-Vatican II canonized saint? He says, 
Consider the thousands that are there in hell right now, burning away at this very second, who have committed fewer sins than I have. There'll be no partialities on a day of judgment. There'll be no peculiar friendships prolonged. The hour of mercy will have come to an end. But I think the only difference between St. Ignatius and all those he, he dreamt about of those who are already condemned before him with fewer sins, the difference is the collaboration with grace and God's infinite mercy received. Now is the time of mercy while we have flesh still on these bones. And the time is like an, an owl clock turned over and all the sand is falling. And there's only a certain amount of time before the sand finishes. Therefore, let us go to confession once a week. Let us receive the sacred flesh of Christ every day. And not with sentimentalities or boredoms, but with stoked virtue, militant zeal of faith, of hope, of divine charity at our own expense. May God be praised and souls be saved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.